Hello, I'm Harry Sewell and welcome to the Seasoning the Reasoning podcast. Reasoning is a term used in Jamaica when people share a conversation and deeply explore a matter of mutual interest. In this series of podcasts, we hope to season the reasoning with curiosity, intellect and in some cases, humour. Enjoy. Welcome to episode one of the Seasoning the Reasoning podcast. I'm Harry Sewell. Today, my special guest is Otto Sharma, and we'll be talking about his theory U and its application to racial justice interventions. Otto Sharma is a senior lecturer in the MIT Management Sloan School and is co-founder of the Presencing Institute. He chairs the MIT Ideas Program for Cross-Sector Innovation and introduced the concept of presencing learning from the emerging future in his best-selling books Theory U and Presence, the latter co-authored with Peter Senge et al. He is co-author of Leading from the Emerging Future, which outlines eight acupuncture points for transforming capitalism. His most recent book, The Essentials of Theory U, summarizes the core principles and applications of awareness-based systems change. Yeah, really enjoyed listening to the uh, interview and your discussion on the um, Collective Trauma Summit. Um, oh. That was really, really good. With yeah. Thomas. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, it was fantastic. The whole summit was very good. And I bought the package. That means I download and listen in the vehicle as I drive. So, yeah, it's been good. But I, I think I heard you as live. Um, it was great. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, it was pre-recorded, actually. Oh, was so, it? Uh, okay. Well, yeah. yeah so you're you're listening to it as a podcast so when you uh yeah yeah so they have on the website the video so i can yeah. see the conversation and you had your slides in the car it's just the audio um okay as but that works as well then yes yeah that's very cool. good yeah that works yeah um very yeah, cool. i've been using the, the phrase about kind of being comfortable with your um is it ignorance mm-hmm. Um, yeah, access your ignorance and yeah. you know, access your discomfort, right? Kind yes. of, or being comfortable with your discomfort, right? So. That's yeah, absolutely. Um, because I'm hosting some groups where people are talking about race in a national charity, and you know, I often say to them, you know, part of what we're doing now is trying to be comfortable um, with that uh, ignorance and discomfort. And, it, it, uh, exactly, uh, Harry. So uh, th- that's. Uh, I uh, recognize that because, uh, I mean, I just did, so I recognize that here in my MIT class with many other groups because people usually think, well, when I start to feel uncomfortable, that's a bad thing. So that's what we should be avoiding. And I try to, I mean, I often at the beginning when you do also executive leadership journeys or something like that, you say, uh, as long as you stay inside your comfort bubble, you're not really learning, right? So yes. which research shows that the most significant learning experience, you don't want to stretch people too far outside, but you don't want to stay inside your comfort zone. So you want to stretch it just a little bit so that you really venture into new uh, territories that are at odds with the stuff that makes you feel comfortable. And only then you start to... Uh, uh, move into a sig- more significant learning experiences. So I think yes. it's, um, and of course, I mean, you know a lot more about that, but uh, I, I think when it comes to, to race, to racial inequality and racial justice and all of these things, I mean, what are the issues we feel less comfortable about, right? Yes. So they, uh, we, we feel uh, more comfortable about, right? So uh, there's almost nothing, right? So, so that's, uh, of course, um, a very important invitation to even explore the territory and not to shut yes. down before, right? You know, absolutely. And, you know, for me, I'm discovering a lot of organizations 
are keen to bypass the process of internal reflection and introspection. And they seek to start initiatives and to do things in the organization without you know, really thinking about their internal conditions. And you know, part of what really drew me to your work was the kind of recognition of you know, the value of you know focusing on the source of kind of you know that reflection and i kind of wondered you know how you make the link between you know theory you and particularly that part about the internal conditions um how do you make the link with the work around race equality that we're currently in um with the uh, you know following the black lives matter um protest and you know, putting things higher up the agenda so sorry you were so just cutting out for for a little moment so so can can you uh, did, did you ask a question or was it uh, yes so, so yeah. i was just asking how do you make the link um with the sort of race equality movement between you know the internal conditions and the work that organizations might do if they're really going to ground their race equality work um yeah. as effectively as possible well i mean i don't know um uh I would say when you when you uh, look at uh, uh, racial justice and racial inequality that we have at a massive scale in the country you are living in and in my country I'm living in here, that particularly here, uh, then um, we know one thing, right? Profound transformation is uh, and change is called for. And in order to come at least in the direction that could be that could deserve the, the term justice, and none of that will happen or will be sustainable if it's not complemented with some inner change, kind of with some kind of with the interior condition that we operate from. That's uh, and that 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 applies to uh, you know probably everyone, right? But particularly to. Uh, Uh, people who today, like me, operate from a, a place of privilege, right? So it has to do with begin to see, learning to see your own blind spot. And um, so, and it, but it's also uh, really uh, applicable to leading change and leading transformation in general. And um, in early in my research, when I inquired into that, uh, so one of the most important uh, insights really that, or maybe the insight that, that put me on that path really um, is when I talked to a lot of practitioners, right? People, innovators or creative people um, or in science or business or society. And one of them, the, the late CEO of Hanover Insurance, uh, his name was uh, Bill O'Brien, he summarized his many years of leading transformational change as a CEO with the following sentence. He said, the su success of an intervention depends on the interior condition of the intervener. So he basically says, this, the success of what we do as change makers, right, regardless where we are, depends on the inner place from that we operate. And when I heard that, right, it was like, wow. Um, so he says that what counts is not only what we do, not only how we do it, right, the process that we use, but what counts is the inner place from that I operate. And really, it puts me on that path. What is that inner place? And today, I would describe this inner place with uh, three um, in terms of three dimensions or three capacities: the open mind, the open heart, and the open will. Basically, the open mind is the capacity to see anything new, right? Because often, of course, our perception is limited to what we know, right? Yes. Yeah. Seeing something new means what we learned in science, right? Yes. So attending to disconfirming data, right? Something you didn't expect. So as a, as a researcher, as a scientist, if you are trained, you lean into that. You're not avoiding that, right? Yeah. So just because it makes you feel maybe challenged or uncomfortable. So the, number, the second one, open heart. So that's the capacity to, uh, that everyone knows who, who deals with real change in life, right? Be that in your family, your organization, your community. And that is looking at a problem, not from your own silo, but through the views of the other guys around the table, right? 
the other uh, stakeholders in your system, particularly the most marginalized. Right. right. So can you not only think about that while you see them, you know, some, someone is suffering? No. Can you feel that? Right. Do you feel that? Can you really sense? And so this is not an idea. It's a capacity and it's called deep listening. Right. So we can tune. It's, it's actually something we can do. I mean, we all are born with that, but it's just like something we call education tends to socialize that out of us. Right. right. But so this and that's um, so that's about connecting with the experience at the margin of our communities. I mean, obvious to say needless to say that this is often communities of color. But not just from a uh, racial justice perspective, but from the perspective of innovation, right? Because right. Um, it's kind of in the community of uh, and 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 the uh, and the marginal experience, kind of the, the experience. So experiencing a system from the margins, from the edges, is actually a capacity you need to train, mm -hmm. because in any system you go. Where's the new coming from? Well, not from the center, not from the top, rarely, right? It comes from the periphery because the dysfunctionality of the old system is most visible there. So that's the second condition. With, it has to basically, it's empathy, right? Kind of right. Yeah. connecting to a perspective that isn't yours and really internalizing, right? So, so using that as a lens kind of to, to understand another dimension of the situation you are facing. And the third one, open will, that really means letting go and letting come. So letting go of the old and letting come of the new. And we all know, I mean, for example, when you are in a big organization, right? Uh, let's say a company or so, likely you have seen a merger, right? Yes. You know, yes, the organization is one now, but in reality, on a people uh, level, it's us and them, right? Yes, of course. So it's all all references to us versus them are about identity. And so if you want to go to, to real change, you need a letting go and letting come. It's not letting go of everything. It's okay. just letting go of everything that isn't essential, right? So that you can more connect with um, what truly is. So those, this kind of, that's kind of the blind spot is cultivating these inner places from which we operate the open mind the open heart open will and if you if we um can use these capacities kind of these uh, and cultivate these places from where we are operating we are less siloed into our own ego perspective and we are more able to truly operate from an ecosystem perspective so Mm. that's so what i'm so so that's really the context of my work and it's uh, uh i mean you can say more to that but it is obviously obviously very applicable to uh, the 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 issues of racial justice because in 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 um, each case it's it is about becoming aware of a blind spot right yes, by yeah. beginning to see this situation through someone else's but not as an idea really as an experience that's kind of connecting with your heart i was struck Which, Go ahead. I was struck, thank you. I was struck um, by two things in particular. One is if organizations and leaders within organizations are going to engage in the way that you describe, there's quite a radical shift because part of what got them to where they are is being known for expertise, whether it be in leadership or in you know the fine subject matter of their field. Um, and even around social justice, around race, there is often a desire to demonstrate to the staff, to the workforce, that you understand and you know. So the encounter with you know black and brown people is often kind of framed within, I hear you, I kind of know what your challenges are. Um, and there's a desire to demonstrate knowledge and competence. But as you describe it, there's a requirement to, to be vulnerable, to kind of you know, let go, to relinquish some of the, the kind of knowledge and the comfort and to just say, actually, this is new territory. So I was struck by um, that. And then the kind of letting go and kind of changing, um, and you described it almost as though um, we move away from the us and them 
And we realize that the problems of racial injustice isn't just something that affects black and brown people, that actually as a society, this is something, um, you know, once we understand it, which is detrimental to all of our well-beings. Um, and I kind of really like that idea that, you know, the model is really enshrined in the belief that, that there is no separation between the marginalized and the people with privilege. In reality, if we, if we listen attentively, as you describe. You're so right. I mean, uh, you put it beautifully. And I think what backs up what you said is um, two, two recent experience. I mean, two experiences, right? One is uh, COVID, yes. right? So when you look at uh, what are the worst performing countries, on average, those, it's not only who are led by autocrats, right? So uh, the, the Trumps and Bolsonaros and Johnsons of the world, <laughs> Well, I, I don't know whether the latter one is a real autocrat, but um, so it's not only by by uh, people show exhibit leadership style of Trumpism, let's put it that way, but it's also the countries uh, research has shown that um, have the highest level of inequality. Right. So, and I think that's like uh, one little data point backing up what you said. So yeah. I may have a lot of wealth myself, mm -hmm. but if I am living on a small island of mm -hmm. happiness, right, yes. in an ocean of suffering and unhappiness, am I really happy? And, and mm -hmm. the answer, the, the empirical answer is no, right? Because then kind of COVID will hit stronger, right? And it will have ramifications also for you on your little island, right? And so the other, um, the, uh, uh, the, the other uh, uh, data point is when you look at um, uh, reports of well-being, right? Mm -hmm. so, so who are in happiness, right? So there are many uh, rankings and reports. And when you look at not only well-being, but also health outcomes and um, education outcomes. There, are, there tend to be the always the same five countries among the top ten, which is the five Scandinavian countries, the Nordic model, right? Mm. So, and um, why is that? Um, and it has to do with a different level. Of, I mean, much lower levels of inequality, much higher level of inclusiveness. So a direction of the economy that is more geared towards well-being and opportunity for all, yes. and not just um, for those that are privileged. Yes. And so famously, kind of the Finnish educational model really focusing all uh, the resources on the weakest, right? Because that is lifting the whole level the country can uh, operate on. So I think there's um, many examples and we now begin, so we are hitting new societal challenges that make us aware if we think just kind of with a small minority, if you think just with a small minority of the privileged, uh, you can make it. And just um, uh, what happens to others has nothing to do with you. As you said, that's just an illusion, right? And yes. it's not backed up by the data. It's not backed up but what we are experiencing right here, right now in 2020, regardless of moral and ethical dimensions, right? You yes. don't even have to bring them in because it's yes. just... Um, mm. and, and in the same way, there is a moral argument, of course, for inclusion and for racial justice. Mm. But you could also... There's an additional, additional way of framing it, and which is kind of uh, innovation. If you want to... Any institution right now in business, right, in government, we need to reinvent ourselves. We need to... We need radical innovation, not just marginal innovation, right? Mm -hmm. How do you do that? Well, not with the same people having the same conversations, right? Right. And the seeds for profound innovation are at the margins of the system. That's why we need to, if we are just stuck inside our own bubble, I'm not talking about individuals now, but I'm talking about uh, uh, institutions, organizations, mm -hmm. then our likeliness to come up with something profound, um, uh, uh, profoundly innovative is, is, is very small. So that's an, I'm not saying it's a better argument. It's just an additional argument. It's like a innovation uh, system perspective 
that is uh, coming up with the same conclusion, which is kind of if you're more inclusive, if you focus more on the well-being of all the stakeholders rather than a few, that will be not only more sustainable, but it will be also more uh, innovative. And the profundity of what you've just said hasn't been lost on me because, of course, the discourse about you know black and brown people and you know people who are socioeconomically disadvantaged, you know, the kind of language of marginalized communities is in such accordance with what you describe about you know the scope for innovation is at the margins that's the place where there is that kind of rich knowledge that can bring innovation um so yeah it's almost like a paradox really that you know the people the very people who are marginalized hold the key to the kind of transformation that organizations are looking for and i guess that's when you know, the system that you described about the kind of, you know, being able to listen and, you know, your four levels of listening really come to the fore, I believe. Yeah, and um, probably, I mean, you have been um, doing quite some applied work on that uh, uh, in the organizational context. So I just wonder whether you would like to share what you see is actually maybe resonating with what I said and what maybe also... Um, uh, you know, um, disconfirming data, maybe kind of uh, some other experiences that are also interesting to explore that maybe lead us to new insights. So, so what are you seeing there when, when you look at your actual experience that you're having? And my experience is that most organizations are very keen to jump to the action stage. The ones um, that are able to sit with the discomfort um, get a kind of change, but there's a turbulence. Um, and that requires uh, patience to sit with the fact that we're not going to gloss over and mask that, but we just kind of live through it. And what I'm finding is that, and I'm beginning to have to reframe, is that actually it's such an ongoing process that it's almost as though each stage, and this is obvious, that each stage is setting a platform to move to another stage of deeper understanding that can lead to deeper transformation. So what I am finding is that despite finishing a stage where it feels incomplete, that actually, that, that's my assessment of it because the work has been done. It's just that it hasn't been tidy. And by definition, it never was going to be. Um, so, you know, there are people who are unhappy, uh, you know, within a workforce. There are some who, you know, find the turbulence so much that they become purely cerebral rather than you know being open-hearted so kind of get you know, variations of representations that for me leads to frustration because i think all right we've not managed to get to that deep level of connection that i was seeking but of course that is a stage and i guess that's what i'm seeing more is that it's iteration after iteration after iteration and even myself as someone who's helping to hold the interve interventions i have to also work on my internal process um to, to not leave the frustration um, but to just literally sit with the uh, discomfort for, for me of slower progress than might be my ideal. Um, so th the main learning for me is it is moving faster than can be seen on the surface, like a river with an undercurrent that is moving a lot faster. And that is an illusion sometimes when it feels slow, um, because actually the, once we engage in the process, the work is being done. It's just recognizable immediately yeah i mean what, what you say uh resonates on um on a few levels kind of uh if you want to go fast first you have to go slow right if you want to go broad in building a movement right i mean that's the one thing i learned over the past 20 years what do you need mm -hmm. to go uh, what do you need, what do you need to do first go deep right in a small place right if you want to go broad <laughs> You go small and deep, right? You, you yes. create your credibility first, right? And a mm -hmm. few local communities. And only then you have really the, um, the legitimacy, right? Uh, to maybe, uh, you know, um, connect to others. And um, so in the same way, what you said, um, so, okay, let's get to action, right? So what are, so that's exactly, of course, the standard, response to anything right so yeah. because it's kind of it it is kind of a, a mindset that thinks of itself as something very practical right and something oriented uh, uh committed to results 
while in reality it is often that very mindset that keeps us in you know in the old trails and the old tracks and what is necessary for people like you and I and many other kind of change makers in the world kind of who try to be helpful in such a situation is no 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 I mean that's um we can't if we just move from okay here's a problem what is the solution we'll just do the same thing right okay, so yes. we'll kind of if we do the same thing the same way we'll create the same results so we have to this is a bigger problem what we are facing here that is not only calling for external action but also for a change interior to ourselves so we need to stop our habitual ways of downloading we need to stop our habitual ways of thinking and acting yes. and we need to make sense together in a much more deeper way and only that right so and and kind of i think what's missing often right and what probably people like you and i and other change makers do is create the holding space right you need to create yes. the permission and the holding space to to say no the most important activity now is not to be busy 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 mm-hmm. yeah. but to make sense right to stop and to attend to what's actually going on and then uncover the deeper dimensions of uh, the problem mm-hmm. so i think that's one thing that i learned how important that is and rarely ever right so the prob when you are addressed kind of can you help us with x Yes. The real project you do is never X, right? No. Because no. it moves to Z or something else. Yes. Because you need to uncover the deeper root issues uh, at play and only if you have uncovered them you will be able to be truly helpful, right? Uh, and so that's one thing that I learned and the other thing I would be interested uh, uh in your view on is what was what's the other problem usually in organizations right okay for sustainability we have a sustainability department right yes. and kind of and i assume right for mm-hmm. uh, all the racial inequality kind of we all also have like a person right be mm-hmm. that a chief uh, officer or something else on which yes. level but delegating that uh, mm-hmm. to a specific function which is disso- dissociated from the leadership at the top right mm-hmm. The, the local line leadership, right? And yes. the, uh, all the way to the, 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 the CEO, mm-hmm. that's the problem because that means kind of it's just blah, 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 right? A lot of hot air, like in corporate, if sitting in corporate affairs and it's, it's not transformative to the mm-hmm. way the organization does business. Mm-hmm. So part of what you do early on is helping uh, the people involved to realize if we really are if if we are real with our commitment to change mm-hmm. it needs to start at the top right and it needs to include the top and it's not like okay uh do something on the organization no i as the ceo need to be part of the process right i need to look into the mirror of my own unconscious bias myself and learning to recognize my own blind spots and only that way i will role model and co-inspire a change in my organization that will be truly transfor- uh, transformational which is that does not just relate relate in some activity kind of and you know airwaves but uh relates into some real change that is both exterior and interior <laughs> It's it's funny. Um, it's only occurred to me listening that I've had a few conversations with organisations and leaders who have spoken about potentially using my services, and I'm struck by the ones who have actually engaged with me are the ones who want to do the deep work. Um, so I'm working with a number of leadership teams who are setting time aside for themselves for the. That their direct reports to do the deep work rather than push it through. And some have said, we don't want to start the program until we have done a number of sessions, until we've begun the process on ourselves, because they recognize um, that you know, the conditions need to be right within the organization, within the leadership of the organization before they start initiatives. And yeah, I was just kind of struck that the ones, there must be something about the dialogue I have at the early stage where some organizations think, all right, okay, so this guy isn't interested in kind of helping us begin an initiative that we can complete by December. Um, and 
somehow it just breaks down at that stage. Um, and there have been organizations I've said, you know, if you're asking me to do an initiative, you know, it's just not what I do. If you're about transformation, I can work with you. And some have, you know, concluded from that, that there's a misalignment. Um, but some of them have just kind of dissolved. And I've only just realized that there's been a pattern to that. It's kind of mm. very striking. Hmm. Yeah, interesting. So, and, and I think kind of you giving them the choice, right? Is, is that what you want? Is, is, or is this what you want? Kind of will help them to really clarify their, their own intention because often in the early stage, that's exactly the issue. You're yes. uh, yourself unclear. It's also often not just one person in an organization contacting you. There are several, and I may have this view, but then there is my boss who sees it, you know, maybe some other way and so on. So there is, um, I think that's a great example where like um, exterior helpers and partners and friends kind of, so, so you need like um, uh, people like that who ask you the right questions. And the reality is just uh, like um, say in my own life, if I go through a period of profound change and shift, right? What do I need? I need a friend, right? Yes. I need somebody who can listen to me, right? Call it, a, call that person a coach or something else, right? But yes. um, so that's, we all know that, right? That's what we do. That's what we provide to our friends, right? So, but where is that often missing? On the level of the organizations, on the level of the institutions, because we are all pointing with the fingers, you need a change, you need a change. Yes. But no organization can change alone. Guess what? Mm. That's not happening. You need an mm. ecosystem around. It takes a little village. Mm. And, you know, I think that's where, um, you know, people like you or I or many others, mm. we are part of that ecosystem, right? And yes. so it's like being truthful without being hostile, right? Mm. Being truthful to really mirroring back holding up the mirror, right? And yes, helping yeah. to decipher what is it we are seeing in the mirror, right? Mm -hmm. And often what we see is, it's not what we would like to see. So mm -hmm. I think that's, and, you know, recognizing that, being truthful with that, and then, you know, um, also seeing the potential, right? What might be possible and moving from one to the other, that, that's really the help on the level of systems that's, um, that, that's so called for now. And yeah, I think that's what the work you're doing is so critical. And yeah, it's funny because, you know, I'm finding your work really interesting, as I've said. And, you know, I apply the concept of the, I'm even from ecosystem to ecosystem when I speak, when I do devel development programs with organizations. But I haven't really included myself in the ecosystem, which is quite strange and bizarre. So, that's very helpful to hear you say that because, of course, um, it makes sense I'm part of their ecosystem, but I've never really applied it to myself. So thanks. That's valuable. Um, I will include. Yeah, well, it just occurred to me in this conversation now, kind of li listening to you and, you know, listening to our conversation, really. So, yeah, but, but I think it is, um, that's part of the role we are playing or not. Yes, yeah. I, I have one kind of, perhaps it's not that radical. It feels a bit radical. Um, exploration with you quickly um, and it's because what we're s discussing sounds less like management theory or you know critical race theory it almost sounds spiritual so maybe it's a nice place to kind of start to draw um, our conversation to a close kind of you know to what extent is there a spiritual dimension to this move towards transformation because if I'm engaging with organizations and asking people to look at their internal conditions, both as an organization and as individuals. And there's a bit of push and the discomfort. That kind of sounds like a spiritual process. What do you think? Well, yeah, uh, of course it has a spiritual dimension, I would say, right? So, because I moved away from Europe. So, no, it's, um, um, no, it's, um, I, I think, um, of course, the, the answer really depends on how do you define spirituality, right? Mm -hmm. So, so, so I, I didn't use the term religious or, or religion, but I think that the, what I mean with the term spirituality is uh, really pointing. So, 
So I use it as a pointer to a level of our own experience that we all have if we pay attention to, right? And it, it connects with this, the, the real sources of our own creativity and of our own essence, if you want, our own kind of um, possi space of possibility. So that's what I mean with the term, right? Kind of, so it's, it, that would be one translation, right? Connected to the sources of our own creativity and sense of who we really are. And um, if you um, if you if you use that, I think the uh, that term th this way, then the way it connects to this bigger picture conversation, really that that we're having is that I would say today we live in a civilizational crisis uh, mm -hmm. or disruption where one civilization is dying and another is wanting to be born. And the one that's dying is basically a way of operating uh, business and our economy and our political system and our educational and media system in a way that is deepening the three main divides of our time, the ecological divide, the social economic divide and the spiritual divide. Nice. So the first one is arising from a disconnect between self and nature, right? Ecological, all the environmental mm -hmm. issues. The second one is really a disconnect between self and other. We talked about that earlier, right? So that's kind of social justice, uh, shocking levels of inequality and so forth. But the third one is sp the spiritual divide is based on a disconnect between self and self, mm -hmm. between small as self, who I am today, and capital as self, who I could be tomorrow, right? Uh -huh. And if these two selves... I'm not really truly connected. What does it look like, feel like? If I feel loss of energy, I feel maybe symptoms of anxiety or depression. And in extreme cases, it may be even risk for suicide. All of which is on a massive upscale, right? More or less proportional to the use of social media, to the use of Facebook and so forth. So... Um, that's a massive problem in the world, right? Because today we all talk a lot about, you know, the environmental crisis, right? We all talk a lot about, I mean, we, there's a lot of hot air about the social and even for, about racial justice, right? Not yes. much, maybe not much is happening, but there's a lot of conversation. Yes, absolutely. But the third one is not even talked about, right? So mm. that's kind of mental health, right? The massive mental health crisis that yes. we have. And, that um, we live in a culture where connecting to my true sources of creativity becomes, you know, we are more and more distracted and right and manipulated by all the gadgets and devices around us. Mm -hmm. So, so that's um, it's not black white, but I think that those are the, the three problems. And if we, yes. my my belief is, if we have learned anything <laughs> over the past few decades, it's this: you cannot solve any of these problems alone you can only address these challenges by looking at all three of these the environmental the social justice and also the interior right the spiritual yes. dimension as three phases of the same problem it's not three problems it's one right, problem. okay and that deeper problem has to do with a deeper shift in awareness and consciousness and the way we organize our economy, our political process, our, our, our learning infrastructures, and so forth. And so that's, that's what I believe. I think it's kind of really, uh, all those things are expression of a deeper shift. And that's why bringing in the term spirituality is um, the way I defined it is actually quite, uh, quite appropriate because if we don't pay attention to our own experiences, the deeper levels of our own experience, we'll not be able to eliminate our own blind spots and we'll not be able to shift the patterns of behavior that today are detrimental to us. Because if you look at the bigger system, right, from a systems perspective, what do we see? We see the following, and that's maybe my closing point. We collectively create results that nobody wants, right? Mm -hmm. Environmental damage, kind of, uh, and, and all the massive, I mean, the uh, racial, systemic racial violence in, you know, the, the 
um, this on the spiritual dimension, it's really kind of the levels of unhappiness, really mental health issues and un unhappiness. No one is standing up in the morning, looking into the mirror and say, okay, today I want to destroy more of the planet, uh, you know, you know, make more hurt, more people with structural violence and make more people uh, around me, including myself, more unhappy. No. no one is doing that yet. This is exactly what we do on a collective level, right? Mm. So that's um, we need to face all three and the 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 deep mindset shift, kind of the spirit, the consciousness, the dimension of consciousness. So so that could be also yes. maybe in Europe a better term to to refer to that the level of awareness and consciousness, right? Shifting yes. from an ego system to an ecosystem awareness. That's a big part of it. And if we are falling short of that, we'll only scratch the surface. I really value the, the way you've explained that um, because often in work around social justice and racial justice, it feels as though people are grappling with the unknown. But actually what you've demonstrated is that there are frameworks to hold this work. And I really encourage um, you know listeners to, to go and read through you and you know your other works related to that because I think it really provides a strong container we don't have to flounder there is an evidence base um, and including from a personal lived experience so I'm really grateful um, for your time and for your insights you're exactly right I mean it's the evidence that we find in research that's one thing but it's also the evidence in our own lived experience as you just said I think that's kind of really the starting point and that's particularly true for activists, right? Yes. Because my first experience in my life was as an activist, right? So that's why I went into the economy because I wanted to transform it, right? So um, uh, in the environmental movement and the civil rights and peace movement in, in Europe. So I think when you're an activist, right? You already have that sense. You feel together as a movement, a future that's possible and that's very different to what's there. Yes. So that sense of that future possibility that you could if you activate collective action could bring into reality that's really at, at, at the foundation of what uh, leadership is about and what this decade our decade of transformation that we are just in the very begin big beginning of is all about so i think that's why it matters and that's kind of the bigger the bigger picture we are we are all part of I'm, I'm smiling so much because when I deliver training courses to social workers and nurses and psychologists and people on the front line, and at the end they say, you know, what, what, what can we do? And I say, well, you're probably now, if you're interested, at the limits of what you can do within the framework of your profession, that what we've just started to talk about is activism, that you know, that collective action that you're talking about that brings transformation can't be done in that you know, interpersonal relationship with individual clients or patients. Um, so that was like, I was smiling because I thought, wow, you've summarized it so well. Absolutely, activism is gonna be the springboard from which we can jump. Thank you so much, I'll say for your- Thank um, you so much, Harry. It um, was great uh, uh, you know, continue the conversation uh, uh, with you and I actually look forward to the next installment. No, great, fantastic. All right. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. That was really interesting speaking with Otto, particularly the point at which we realized that we could perhaps identify ourselves as active interveners in the field of racial justice, that we were considered to be part of the ecosystem, um, which is described in his work on Theory U. It was also really relevant to me the way in which many of the concepts from Theory U can be directly applied to the work of racial justice. And I'm really looking forward to reading more and perhaps working more with Otto Sharma on this. Please do visit his website and check out the Essentials of Theory U um, for more information on the concepts and ideas. Thank you.